the saga of the American Revolution begins. In Boston, political radicals encourage the acts that lead to the revolution, and 13 divided, ill-prepared colonies reluctantly join forces to battle the most powerful nation on earth. Passion governs, and she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created equal, victory or death. Behind me is Philadelphia's Independence Hall. Inside, men in funny-looking, brightly colored coats and powdered wigs selected Virginia plantation owner George Washington as commander-in-chief of a rebel army, debated and signed the Declaration of Independence, and drafted the United States Constitution. Those men in that time are wrapped in a mythical patriotic fog. Join us as we lift that fog to discover the very human men and women who shaped one of the most influential and exciting periods in history, the American Revolution. It was a war that began in a single bloody day. On the night of April 18th, 1775, a Bostonian of French descent rode hard into the Massachusetts countryside. His name was Paul Revere, and his sturdy hands fashioned some of the finest silver pieces in colonial America. Sometimes he used his metalworking skills to sculpt false teeth. His ride that night was a link in a chain of events that would lead directly to the eight-year war for America's independence. Before the end of that long war, Revere would be court-martialed and finally acquitted for his role in an American naval fiasco. But it was this ride that would make him immortal. Paul Revere was one of several people who had volunteered to be alarm riders. As it turned out, Paul Revere's ride took him in the same direction that the British were going to march. The message Paul Revere and his fellow alarm riders carried was about a column of 700 British troops marching from the port of Boston into the Massachusetts countryside. I rode upon a full gallop for Mystic Road. In Medford, I awakened the captain of the Minutemen, and after that, I alarmed almost every house till I got to Lexington. Paul Revere. In Lexington, in this house, Revere found the friends he wished to warn of the British advance. Samuel Adams, a political agitator and propagandist, and John Hancock, the wealthiest man in New England, once described as a young man whose brains were shallow and pockets deep. They were both radicals and targets of the British. But General Thomas Gage, commander of the King's Army in Boston, had more to be concerned about than two radical leaders. He knew that colonists were storing weapons and ammunition in nearby Concord. 
he saw that they were organizing themselves into independent military units. There was already a military organization in the colonies. It was the colonial militia. But they were beginning to form from the militia these people called the Minutemen, who were one-third of the militia group, the most active, the youngest men, ready to move at a moment's notice. The road to Concord ran through Lexington. On the village green, 77 of these Minutemen and militiamen organized in the early morning of April 19th. The militia had no intention of stopping the British at Lexington. They simply lined up uh, along the common in a rather pathetic display of force, and they were ordered not to fire on the British. Gage had marched troops into the Massachusetts countryside before, looking for arsenals, and he had met colonial militia before. But those meetings had ended bloodlessly, with the British turning around and marching back to Boston. At Lexington, 23-year-old Sylvanus Wood, barely five feet tall, had a view from the militia line. The officer swung his sword and said, Lay down your arms, you damn rebels, or you will all be dead men. Sylvanus Wood. As often occurs in this kind of confrontation, there was a nervousness about the whole operation, and somehow someone fired a shot and started a war. I saw and heard a gun fired, which appeared to be a pistol. Then I could distinguish two guns and then a continual roar of musketry. Paul Revere. There was some dispute about who fired the first shot. Um, it was very natural, the most natural thing in the world, for the troops to open fire on armed opponents. At the end of the encounter, eight colonists were dead. Two were wounded. Only one British soldier had received a minor flesh wound. For most of them, as well as the Americans, this was their very first taste of battle. They had just fired on their own British troops. After all, this would be like the United States National Guard standing at Lexington and firing at the regular army that comes close to them. The British marched on to Concord and began to seek out the hidden arsenals. Believing their town was about to be destroyed, the Minutemen and militiamen acted. They moved on the British companies left to hold the bridge over the Concord River. As the rebels marched towards the bridge, the British fired a warning shot. Then they fired into the approaching colonists. The American rebels fired back. British soldiers were killed. The confrontation on Concord Bridge started a 19-mile running battle as nearly 11,000 Minutemen and militiamen from all over the state rushed toward the road from Concord to Boston, the avenue of the British retreat. Over 4,000 of them would reach the road to fire upon the King's army. The real battle took place on the march back to Boston. Uh, and it was a very bloody process with the Americans pouring in shots at this British column from both sides and the British sending out flanking parties into the fields uh, to catch uh, many an unwary American from behind and uh, bayonet him in the back. And then they've had to fight their way through several towns and there was a lot of house-to-house -house fighting. It was really a brawl. Of the musket balls that rained around the Redcoats, only one in the 300 found its mark. Ironically, the Americans fired with British-made brown vest muskets, which they had been issued as militiamen. The weapon was notoriously inaccurate. We were fired on from all sides, but mostly from the rear. The country was an amazing strong one, full of hills, woods, stone walls, etc., which the rebels did not fail to take advantage of. We marched miles, their numbers increasing from all parts, while ours was reducing.